word this morning, I'd like to call up Pastor A.T. Mona. He has uh, something to share with us concerning the ministry of the people. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to let everybody know that this coming Friday into Saturday, um, our students are going to be attending a, a True Love Wake seminar. Um, normally, when we have True Love Wake seminar, we, uh, we focus on uh, purity, uh, how to encourage kids to seek God in relationships, especially leading into marriage. Uh, but what's different about this seminar is um, we're going to be uh, hitting purity from a bunch of different angles, not only focusing on uh, relationships with a significant other, but finding out how to be pure in terms of our relationships with our friends, with our families, um, with other peers, and so forth. Um, I think it's a great way to challenge our students and encourage them. Um, I apologize for the late notice on this. I did just start last week, but I do feel that this is an opportunity that we want to take. Um, it's going to start this Friday night. It's going to be held in Randolph. Uh, it's kind of a joint endeavor with a couple churches within the association. Um, it starts on Friday night at 7 p.m., so um, for students needing a ride, a bunch of us are going to be leaving from here um, around 6 if we could. But if you want to drive your own kid over to Randolph, I'll give you the address. Um, and if you would like to have your child just sleep over into Saturday, uh, we'll even give you guys permission slips later on and all the details for um, some of the host houses that are going to be housing of kids, we're going to be separating the guys and the girls. So I strongly encourage you to send your kids out. Uh, feel free to talk to me about it afterwards so we can make some arrangements. Um, if you have any other questions, I'm also looking forward to meeting the parents. I'm scheduling a specific time to meet with all of you next Sunday um, after the service. I look forward to getting to know each and every one of you. Um, thank you. God bless.
that and we only do it as a church to encourage us to, to have a prayer, uh, corporate prayer. And so the message this morning will answer some of your questions. What is fasting or what are we doing fasting? So that's what we're going to see. And if you read the Bible, you will, especially in the New Testament and also in the Old Testament, there are a lot of uh, issues or, or situations that God's people are encouraged to pray and to fast and to ask God and to wrestle with God. So before we start, let's go once again, let's bow our heads as we look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have this precious lesson before us today to remind us that you yourself, Lord Jesus, have gone through this and help us to understand, help us to process it in our minds and, and be able to, to really make a decision to, to do this. Uh, we just pray that you will give us the strength and the power and the understanding to be able to obey you in this way and to make your word to you today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before, before I start again, let me just uh, let everybody know that on the 23rd, Pastor AJ again will, will share the word. So he's, he's sharing the burden of, uh, of uh, teaching and preaching. And uh, Lord willing, next month, uh, we might have two speakers. I have a call from Pastor Jerry, you know, one of the missionaries that we have. Uh, Pastor Pete Wong is coming. His, uh, his name is... Last name is Wong, he's uh, Chinese, but he's Tagalog and he's Filipino. Uh, he's coming, he's from Virginia, he's coming to uh, visit PCI, and also I will invite him uh, on the third Sunday of March. And then the 30th of March is Pastor uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Whitman's turn to come and, and share the word. And you will hear more about Israel from from Dr. Brian Whitman, and also pray for him because he is going back to Israel this week or two weeks from now to uh, uh, lead some more tours, and then uh, he's involved in uh, the peace talk that is going on in Israel. It's not a it's not a collaborated or or, or uh, big event that's going. It's it's more on a closed door kind of uh, meeting with the leaders of Israel and the leaders of Palestine and even some from other groups, extremists, and they're meeting to resolve conflicts. Uh, and uh, it's a very dangerous endeavor that he's doing. Uh, his life is always uh, in danger. Uh, but he feels that it, that's, that's how the Lord is wanting him to, to do. And I have a lot of meeting with him and uh, Lee on last uh, Thursday. And uh, let me just share this shortly. One of the one of the meetings that they had, he had one question. Because well, here are the Israelite <coughs> leaders and here are the Palestinian leaders, and and they were in, in this room and they were going to eat together. And and Dr. Bryant's question is, why am I here? <coughs> why do you invite me here? And, and they said, uh, because you have, been, you have been in Israel for a long time, 30 years, and you've seen, we've seen your commitment to both, and you, you are a very um, trustworthy person. We trust you, that's why we invite you. So that's, that's the situation. Okay, so our first picture there is, uh, you see the mountain on top there, or like farther, the farthest mountain, that's the, the Mount of Transfiguration. That's where our passage here uh, says in, in Matthew chapter 17 uh, that they were that they came to that they, they climbed the mountain and that's where uh, Jesus was transfigured and we can go near that we're so far away but we we closed up our cameras as close as we can and that's the closest that I can get in the pictures. So uh, our our message today is about prayer and fasting. Now now really. Extraordinary kind of message, but it's been um, a practice of, of believers, and a lot of Christians today are ignoring it and saying that's not for me, or I think I cannot do that. So why don't we open our Bibles to uh, uh, the book of Matthew? We have two passages in your outline, but I'm just going to focus on Matthew because in Mark it's just about talking about the bridegroom, 
and you can read that yourself later on in your study. But let's focus on Matthew chapter 17. You will be surprised that our passage today doesn't talk much about fasting up to the last verse in verse 21. But then, uh, I'd like for you to, to follow me along as I read. Uh, I'm, I'll be reading from the New King James Version this morning. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 21. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <coughs> While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first, and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come, or has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Verse 13, And the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. And when they had come to the multitude, that means they are, they are already down. A man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from the very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 29, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. May the Lord bless the reading of his words into our hearts. A couple of things in this passage before we dig deeper. When, when Jesus told them in verse 17, O oh, faithless and perverse generation. And then when he answered the question of in verse 19 when the disciples said, Why can we not cast it out? And then Jesus answered, Because of your unbelief. You see, beloved, when we approach prayer and fasting, we, we approach God asking for something from Him, believing that He will give it to us. And the reason why they could not cast this evil spirit is because they doubted. That's the bottom line. And so this morning, we're going to talk about this subject of prayer and fasting. And I really believe with all my heart that there is great power when we do this individually or as a family or as a church. But I've said a while ago, many Christians today, either they ignore it, 
they say it's not for me. I, I'm already, I think I'm already a strong Christian. I don't need to fast anymore. I have all the things that I ask from the Lord, so why would I fast? And then there are those who misunderstand what fasting is all about. For them, maybe fasting is just skipping lunch or skipping dinner or not eating at all during the day, and that's for them is fasting. But when you just skip meal, it's not fasting, it's just dieting. Fasting should be followed up with prayer. And so, uh, you can move along with, with the next slide. There you go. There's, there's food there. And, and I don't know if you can see the words. That's our lunch actually in one of those stops that we had. That's, that's my lunch there. Uh, uh, the wrap and the soda and, and a small salad. And that's how we eat. We don't eat really a lot, but I don't, I don't know why I gain so much. Uh, <laughs> I think every time we're in the hotel, we just we just eat uh, because there's just you know, so much food. So uh, fasting to define fasting is that fasting is simply abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. So that's that's the meaning of fasting: abstaining from regular eating for spiritual purposes, not for other purposes. And there are many ways that you can do fasting. You can do a full fast, which you don't really take anything, just like uh, when. when <coughs> When, uh, is it Esther? When uh, the, the Jews are about to be executed, she said, three days, don't, don't even drink. Don't take anything. That's, that's full. That means it's really, really urgent. Um, you can do that if you really have a, a, a really heavy burden in your heart. Maybe for a whole day or two days, if you can endure that. And, and meaning that you, you, you sacrifice preparing food, you sacrifice eating, you sacrifice your appetite because coming to God is more important than eating and being satisfied. And then there is what we call liquid only fasting where you only drink water or uh, juice or whatever. And then there's what we call the parcel uh, fasting which you, you skip a meal or you skip from your regular diet and go for fruits only or vegetable only. And, and whatever kind, you can combine all this when you fast. And so, going back to our passage, Jesus returned from the top of the mountain, and with his disciples, with these three guys with him, his close friends, and, and with, with Peter, James, and John. And upon their return, they, they were met with this situation. And we identify this situation as we call it as unmet need. There is a, there's a need that was not met by the rest of the disciples down there while they were there. Now, in chapter 10 of Matthew, you would remember that Jesus Christ sent them two by two, right? If you read your Bibles, go back to chapter 10, you will find out that Jesus gave them the power to cast out evil spirit, to heal all kinds of sickness. But then when they were faced with this young man of... Uh, have a, an evil spirit in his life. The Bible describes it as he has an epileptic, but then he has he has demon in his body that they need to cast. And and they have a problem there. They couldn't do it. And so with this unmet need, the Lord Jesus Christ came down with the rest of the disciples, and they were met with this situation. You know, in our Christian life, there are times that we feel after church that we're so so high spiritually that sometimes we need to wake up to reality. When you come home, you know that this is real life. After worship today, you would go out there, you would go back to your jobs tomorrow, and, and it's the same situation, maybe. And so that's exactly what they encountered there. But then, when Jesus saw the situation, when they told him about that, he, he healed this young man. He exercised his power. And now the problem is solved. There is no more unmet need, but then there is an unanswered question. A question that they need to ask the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is, why could we not cast out this demon? Oh Lord, we know that you have entrusted to us this, this special power. We were there, out there. Healing sick people and, and not doing all this, but then why is this happening to us? And again, looking at ourselves, we, we know that 
there are unanswered prayers in our lives. And the Lord still needs to see other areas of our life that needs that He needs to work. And so their question was answered by Jesus. And I don't know if they are expecting this answer, but to their question, Jesus gave them an unexpected reply in verses 20 to 21. And to paraphrase this, Jesus says, Men, you only need a little bit of that faith of yours. That means Jesus is telling them, you already have that faith in your life, but you need to exercise it some more. Now, in our sharing time last yesterday, last night, uh, during our Breaking the Fast, I think it's Brother Adam who shared about the mustard seed. The mustard seed is very small, but it has a very strong taste. So, if it is very small, but if you bite it, it will fill up your mouth with the taste, with the, with the spice or whatever it's there. And that's exactly what we should be. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. You are not powerful, you're not, you're not really that many, but your life should consist of that, that energy. That when people see you, that when you ask God, He will answer. And that they will feel the power of God through them or through you. And so, Jesus told them, Man, you only need a little bit of that faith of yours and you can move mountains. And Jesus says, as I can to paraphrase this verse, He said, let me encourage you, don't doubt the power of faith in God for a moment. Or the power of God in your life for a moment. This kind of demonic problem does not go out except by prayer and fasting. That's what Jesus said right there. And so, beloved, in this life there are needs that are really, really great. It couldn't be solved with our our abilities, mentally and even physically. There are obstacles in this life that have a, a different different dimension of difficulty about them. And some of the things that we encounter in this life requires breakthrough in the spiritual realms. Remember, Paul is telling us that we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers, against the power of the darkness. Spiritual problems needs to be solved with the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Jesus says that there is a way to obtain the spiritual power to break through such needs. And I want you to look at this phrase here. And I'm sure you would agree with me. Prayer with fasting releases breakthrough spiritual power. When you pray and you fast, that's what's going to happen. When Jesus was led up into the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 to be tempted, the temptation came after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And Luke described it in Luke chapter 4 verse 14 that after that time he, he, he returned in the power of the Spirit. So he's weak, his body, his physical body is weak, but his mind and his strength and his spirit is, is full of power because he, he spent time with his Father. And so beloved, if you're saying that fasting is not for you, you have to think twice and you have to really remember that Jesus, Jesus gave so much importance with this. And Jesus knew that this is a, a great thing to do. And he set himself as an example to us. And what did he do in his life? Jesus developed a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. And so why did we say that? Why did I say that? Now it's, it's very clear that he has been fasting through his life when he encountered this young man with an evil spirit in his life. He, he cast it out and said that the reason he'd been able to was because this kind only come out by prayer and fasting. What is he implying there when he says that? Because he has been fasting in his life. That's why when the need arises, he's ready. And so, beloved, 
As Christians, I believe that we need to be ready all the time to, to encounter problems, spiritual struggles in this time. There are times that you will, you will face a struggle that is beyond your control and your strength. And if you're not ready spiritually, you will run away from the enemy. Because the evil spirits, they, they know if we are weak as Christians. They know. They're not all knowing, but they can see. They can see what we've been doing in life. And that's why when Jesus spoke to this evil spirit, he immediately, the evil spirit immediately came out of that young man's life. Jesus is always ready for every occasion in life and ministry because he developed a lifestyle of prayer with fasting. And so here in ICF, we, we plan to do it at least uh, initially every start of the year or maybe in the middle of the year. I don't know, but let me encourage you, let me tell you, make it as part of your prayer life. As a Christian, we don't need to wait for January next year as a church to do another fasting in the church. But you can do it in your life. That's, that's what I would like to bring this morning to our message. If there's one thing that we need to bring home with you this morning, that should be the challenge. You need to do it yourself individually. And it will take discipline, it will take struggle, it will take a lot of time. And maybe you're thinking, what should I pray for? I don't need really uh, uh, an urgent thing to pray, to fast. Right? It really doesn't matter. There's a lot of needs in this earth that we can fast for. Not maybe in your, in your personal life, but just look around. Look at our government. Look, what, look what's going on in this country. And look what's going on in other countries. Look what's going on in the world. That Jesus is evidently coming so very, very soon because of what's going on in the world. And so talking about prayer, there's a man by the name of E.M. Bounds. He's a well-known um, man of full of wisdom, a lot of spiritual quotes about prayer. And he mentioned that uh, this is not being, being biased for men only, but when he says men, I'm sure he, he, he talks about everyone. Uh, women and even children. Ian Bounds wrote, God's cause is committed to men. It means to us, His cause. God commits Himself to men. Praying men are the wise regents of God. They do His work and carry out His plans. You see, God works through us when we pray. I Beloved, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe it is ordained by God. And I believe that God answered our prayers when He said to His disciples, If you believe with all your heart, you will receive what you are asking from the Lord. But then, there's, there's also a question. Why is fasting not being productive to others? Well, I don't have all the answers to that. But what I know is that when you pray and you fast, and you urgently seek the Lord for those things in your life, if you need an answer, He will give you an answer. And this morning I'd like to, to give you some thoughts that I have, what is fasting all about. I see fasting as vital in prayer because of these three things. First of all, Fasting reminds us of our humanity. You agree? Fasting reminds us of our humanity. It's always good to be reminded of our humanity when we come to God. That He's God, I'm not. To come to God feeling a sense of helplessness is not, is not handicapped or is not weakness, but it's a good start in this life. Meaning, you're, you're letting yourself 
really, really down there, prostrating before God and acknowledging Him to be God and that He controls everything. And when we do that, it makes us dependent upon God. But you know, the problem is a lot of people, a lot of even Christians today, they don't like that thought of being dependent upon God because they, they know they can do something to themselves. They can take care of themselves. Second, fasting humbles us, or it should do. There is self-denial involved. We deny the physical appetites of our body for a time. Humble ourselves before God, who has all the answers for our lives. And then, fasting also is a sign of our desire. When we fast and pray, we're saying that the Lord is far more important to us than the daily routine of finding food for ourselves or preparing food. You know, today, you don't find food. I mean, if you have money, you just go to uh, a drive through and you can eat right away, very quickly. But during the time of the apostles, during the time of Moses and Abraham, they, they have to prepare their food. They have to look for the food. Now, if you are fond of watching uh, Bizarre Food by Andrew Zimmer, one of, the, one of the episodes was that he was in Africa, and he visited this village who are so far away from many modern science and developments. So, so there, the people uh, limit themselves from the other, from the, from the world. I mean, they limit the visit of the tourists. So they just live in a small village, and they don't have refrigerators. They don't have all these things that preserve their food. So they, they before dinner, they kill the goat around 4 p.m., and then they, they prepare their meal. They, they, they boil it, and then they cook, they, they, they roast it, and then they eat together as, as a tribe, as a family. And then the next day, the same thing. They have to look for the food. During the day, they would go, the, the men would go uh, as far as maybe three miles to look for food and to look for uh, whatever they can find to bring home to their family so that they can have food. But here, you know, what are we going to cook this evening? Shop right, go to Costco, and then just, just Bring it home and you can, you can have it. And when you pray and fast, you don't worry about those things, right? You just sit there and say, God, you are the priority today and tomorrow. I want to bring this burden before you. We're not trying to twist the arms of God, but it's a display of genuine earnestness of our desire. And so, beloved, fasting is very significant. But sadly, it's overlooked by so many Christians today. For those of you who know David Yonggi-chu, pastor of the largest church in the world, although uh, I don't know if you would believe it if I say that his mem the, member of the, the membership of the church right now is one million. One million members. Not attenders. Members of the church. Now, the, mes the, the reason why I mentioned him is because I, I was reading his, uh, I googled him, and according to that, right now he's around 70 years old, but so he started very young, and, and the church is still growing. Now, according to uh, what, I, what I found out there, is that the way they run the church is that when a member has a problem, they actually, they, they don't counsel. They don't pray actually for them, they don't counsel the members. Because any member who would come to them with a problem, with a struggle, they would say, go to the prayer mountain and pray and fast for three days and then come back. And so when that member comes back with the same problem, with struggle still, they would say, go back to the prayer mountain and stay there for a week. And when they would return to the same problem, go back to Prayer Mountain, spend time there, 10 days, 
and then after 40 days, they never come back into it. Because <laughs> the problem is already solved. Because they spent time praying and fasting. And that's why God is working so powerfully in the church. What would happen if we do that here? <laughs> we don't have a mountain to pray, but we have a bear mountain. <laughs> Put a bear mountain to pray there. Well, again, let's go back to our text when it says, but Jesus answered their question, Lord, why cannot we cast this evil spirit in this young man's mind? Jesus said, because you doubted. You did not believe. And again, Jesus said, if you have faith with this smallest master, you will say to this mountain, move over there and the, the mountain will move. Let me say this again. Prayer with fasting releases breakthrough spiritual powers. And so, if you're still saying, it's not for me, again, let me challenge you. You, you, you need to try it. You need to try that. And so, let me give you some practical things you need to observe about how you ought to approach prayer and fasting in your life. First of all, fasting must not be as the hypocrites do in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, when Jesus warned them about fasting, about prayer and fasting. And Jesus said, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. <coughs> or assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. That's why when we were in Israel, we, we went to the Western Wall where, uh, you know, people are going there to, to pray. And, and, and I'm not criticizing it. I'm not saying it's wrong to go there. I prayed there. I tied before the Lord in front of that wall. But I didn't write my prayer in, in, in paper and stick it there. I said to the Lord, Lord, you know my heart. And whatever I commit to you here, it's between you and me really going to do it. And I committed my life there to the Lord uh, with the things that I need to change in my life. And so, that's what the warning of Jesus, don't be a super Christian when they fast, they announce to everybody that, hey, look at me, I am fasting. I am holy. Because fasting should be in secret. Matthew chapter 6, verses 17 to 18, as Jesus continues to exalt them and he says, but you, that means you, my disciples, you, my followers, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. That means, actually, you should look healthier and, and fresher when you fast. So that you do not appear to men to be fasting. It's not being a hypocrite. It's just being yourself and being true to God. But to your Father, who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. That means when you when you fast before the Lord, you should know it as a person, and maybe your your spouse or your children knows that you are fasting. And again, on most occasions uh, there are exceptional or exceptions here about corporate fasting as a church, or uh, in the Book of Esther, or in the Old Testament when when uh, uh, you know, uh, a certain nation is almost uh, invading another nation and, and, and the Lord said, don't worry, trust me, I'll, I'll deliver you, right? And so, and so they, they trusted the Lord, they, they waited, they fasted. And the next morning, the vast army that is around them are all dead. They killed themselves. That's in the Old Testament. I cannot really remember the king, the name, king of the name, or the name of the king, but it happened if you read the old Bible in the Old Testament that they that they were so scared, but the Lord said, "I'll I'll I'll handle it." And so I don't know what happened to the to the armies that are going to invade them. Maybe they got they got confused and they thought that you know when they wake up in the morning, enemy. <laughs> so they kill each other, and so they 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 just won the battle right there, and the Lord won the battle. And then, thirdly, fasting in the Bible always coupled with fervent prayer. 
There's no spiritual value in hunger alone. Dieting is not fasting. And so let me challenge you once again. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus said to his disciples that they would not fast while the groom is, is there. But when the groom is away, then they will fast. That's exactly what happened. So while Jesus was with them, it was Jesus who was fasting. But then when Jesus ascended up to heaven after his resurrection, then they prayed and they fasted. And that's when the Spirit of the Lord came down in, in a form of, of golden tongues and dwelt upon them and empowered them. And in this day, we have great need of His power in our lives. I can see that in your faces. I can see that, you can see that in my face. We need the power of God in our lives today for some breakthroughs in our lives in our church, in our families. And I believe that Jesus wants for us to fast and pray. And so each slide right now is a form of question. First question is, do you feel dry spiritually? Do you feel dry in your life? Seemingly nothing is happening and you're not even uh, serious about going to the Lord in prayer. Another question, do you feel powerless against the world at the end? And that's, and that's the situation right now that we feel. We feel that we couldn't even win the struggle spiritually. But whenever we think about that, let's always remember that God is still on the throne. It doesn't matter how, how the world becomes so powerful in the eyes of the world. It's still God is in control. The next question is, are you in need of renewal? If you need renewal, maybe you need to be on your knees and skip a day meal. And you need to fast and pray. Maybe that's what we need as a church. And so, beloved, let me encourage you once again, after the service, pick up one of those materials in the back. Bring it home with you. And don't rush to it. Read it through. Prepare yourself. And think, list down the burdens in your heart that you need to pray. And do it faithfully before the Lord. And watch what we will do in your life. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your words for us today. Thank you, Lord, that when we are on our knees, the enemy, the devil, trumpet. Because that's the only weapon that we can use to defeat the enemy. And Lord, help us to be victorious in this area of our Christian life, our prayer life. And help us, Lord, to be bold enough to come before you, humbling ourselves, admitting that there's nothing we can do apart from you in this life. Thank you once again, O oh Lord, for your precious words that you have taught us today. Just name it.
God wants us to experience what He experienced. Just like what we did in Israel, where He walked, we did walk. Where He meet people, we did meet people. In the same token for all of us here at ICF. Let's give our offering in celebration of our relationship with our God and Father. I'd like to call on the answers. Thank you. 